Welcome to Killer Psychologist. I'm Dana Anderson, a forensic psychologist and your host of the show. Killer Psychologist is for true crime fanatics and anyone intrigued with the dark side of psychology. Welcome to the Killer Psychologist podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Dana Anderson, and today we are doing a part two of John Bonet Ramsey. While this can't be a standalone episode, a lot of things that we're going to talk about, I would encourage you to listen to part one. First, we're going to give you new information today to go off of our part one of the things that we talked about that are groundbreaking in the John Bonet Ramsey case. So I have with me my two favorite experts who are on the show with me all the time, who I love. So we have cold case profiler Jason Jensen, and we have forensic psychologist, attorney, and professor Dr. Craig Wetter. So we're going to specifically talk about some things about this case. And as we know, John Bonet Ramsey, her death in 1996 is a cold case. It's one of the most famous cases, and it's gotten a lot of media attention through the years. One of the things that I want to focus on this episode is that there have been people that have come forward and confessed to killing John Bonet Ramsey. And so we're going to talk about false confessions today. Why there are false confessions? Who's the most likely to do it? We're going to talk about specifics in this case and why it's different than Gary Oliva, who is currently the individual who has confessed to killing John Bonet Ramsey. And so I'm going to start out with Jason Jensen about false confessions. So this is where people want to critique this case and say, well, this person already confessed to this. So why is it the wrong person? Right, right. It's quite interesting, uh, the fact that a case can get, you know, a number of false confessions over time. and, And you have to question why someone would falsely confess to a crime they didn't commit, especially if it then also directs the case to that person away from the true offender, and law enforcement goes through all these rigors to you know build a case, arrest, pro- try to prosecute, just to find out that there was no actual tie between the person and the crime. What really got my interest in confessions to begin with was my years in defense, uh, we'd oftentimes come across a case where, for various reasons, a suspect that hires us can say, well, you know, there's a, you know, there's a statement, there's confessions, there's a, or there's admissions. You know, we get discovery from the prosecutor, and we have to defend it. We get the advantage of being able to talk to our client directly to get their, you know, inside understanding, but oftentimes you can't present that at trial. You have to work around it. What stood out to me after the, you know, the advent of DNA analysis in in criminal cases around the, you know, turn of 2000 and thereafter, there started to become a lot of DNA exonerations to come about. And by the time we hit around 300 exonerations where DNA has reversed the conviction, the statistics start to show out of those 300 so on convictions, up to 25% of them had included with them confessions. So uh, obviously, they're false confessions if DNA proves otherwise. So that's what really got my attention. So then, uh, when I was going through my master's uh, program, I actually did a series of different papers that when I, in 2014, when I graduated, I took those different assignments and merged them into a, a single article, and I published it in the Journal of Forensic Research and Criminal Studies, and it's still available to this day, all the analysis and understanding about false confessions 
confessions from my standpoint, and it's very compelling why it's important not to rely on confession evidence only and the strategies that law enforcement really engaged in for many decades, like using the the read method and things like that can lead to false confessions. And so, you know, here we are, fast forward to, to the John Benet Ramsey case. You know, we know that over time there's been false confessions. One most notable one was the uh, John Mark Carr one that led to his arrest in 2006, and he had to be extradited from Bangkok, Thailand. And then we learned that it was a false confession. In the case that we're working on with Gary Oliva, he has also confessed. And many of the armchair web sleuths out there will sit back and say, well, you know, it's probably a false confession like John Mark Carr. It's like just because you have one false confession, you can't use that as an excuse to, to, to nullify every other confession that comes along. You have to look at each case separately and understand why it was a false confession and then look at the, the merits of this confession to see if it can be corroborated by the evidence. That's really what we've gone through to do in, in our independent investigation is understand why we should take the statements. And I consider them admissions more than confessions. He says he's responsible for it in letters, but he doesn't say that he, that he uh, murdered her per se or give the details consistent with a murder. but. People tend to uh, downplay their role, you know, whether it's remorse or a defense mechanism, that they will say that, you know, she died rather than I killed her. They'll say it was an accident because they don't want to own up to the fact that it was a, an evil, heinous act that they set out to do. So in the situation of Gary Oliva, he said it was an accident and he said that uh, she died in his arms and that alone, if you just look at the verbiage that he used, you say, well, it's not consistent with the evidence, you know, because because they claim that there was a garage used and, and it was, uh, you know, sadistic and it was intentional as opposed to, you know, where Gary says, I didn't mean to do it. So you have to accept that they're claiming responsibility more than you're parsing the words verbatim and saying, yes, it's an outright confession, because it was, you know, to a friend that he doesn't want to lose that relationship by being so disconcerting that the friend then disowns him, and now he has no one in his life. What do you think about that, Craig? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, the minimization of, of details is, is a common thing that we do see with a true confession, right, or admissions. Right. Um, so oftentimes you'll see this uh, distancing going on in the language that a, a suspect uses when they describe their involvement in a crime, particularly like a really you know a, a heinous crime like a murder, if it involved anything um, very sadistic, which is suggested in this case. Um, that's I wouldn't be surprised that if if in fact this is true, um, that minimization is also not part of it because that 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 can be seen. I mean, I've interviewed thousands of criminal defendants uh, post Miranda waiver. And believe it or not, m most people, they'll talk, they'll talk to, they'll talk to law enforcement. Um, most people waive their rights. Um, the smart ones don't or <laughs> don't waive, but uh, most, most do. I think it'd be interesting to explore the psychological factors that could impact someone's vulnerability to confess to something that they didn't commit, a crime that they didn't commit. And we can, we can talk about that because I think there's some interesting things uh, there as well. You mentioned the read technique, and that's for those that don't know that. I, so that's a technique that is taught, and it's actually still taught today. It's called the read interrogation technique, and it was developed in the 1950s by um, a guy's name was Reed, and he was actually a former uh, police officer who became a psychologist, is my understanding. So here's one of the big tactics that, that investigators use. Um, so there's two phases to any sort of interview of a suspect. If we think someone's involved, there's an interview phase. And then there's an interrogation phase. There's two phases to the investigation. When you get into the interrogation phase, uh, this is where confrontation comes into play. And people may not know this, but law enforcement can manipulate. In other words, um, we can lie to the, the suspect about evidence that we have or don't have. Uh, we can make up all kinds of falsities about things. And 
all of that is essentially upheld in the courts um, as acceptable. It doesn't it doesn't feel right, does it? That you're you're lying to a you're lying to somebody about evidence that you say that you have that you don't. Uh, but the underlying premise of why this is acceptable still is that the assumption is is that an innocent person would know that the police don't have that evidence, right? So if they're if they're if if you're they're saying we have your DNA on us on an object. If you know that that's not possible, you know, if you're, you're innocent, right? You're not, you're not, you didn't commit the crime and you just know that's not possible. You're not likely to confess. That's not likely to influence or persuade you to confess. But that ignores one problem. And that is individuals who are intellectually uh, disabled, individuals who have cognitive impairments um, or other mental health vulnerabilities. There's evidence in the research literature that suggests that these folks, uh, particularly people who are highly suggestible, are the ones that are at biggest risk uh, of falsely confessing to a crime they didn't commit. Well, and, you know, I would also add to that that there may be other uh, scenarios where someone confesses, think, well, maybe my, you know, there was trace DNA there, but I'm protecting a family member or something. So depending on the dynamics of all the players in the case, they may be taking responsibility, thinking, well, you've got something that traced for me, but I'm protecting my wife or I'm protecting a, you know, a, a minor. But mental health is usually one of the major components that lead to a false confession because they're vulnerable. And another one that comes to mind uh, while I'm speaking here a lot is sometimes it's out of convenience. So like it's not necessarily a, a major crime, like a felony. But it's like, well, they're offering me a chance to take a plea and I get out with only two days served as opposed to I have to sit for trial because I can't afford bail. And they'll think, oh, I'll just go ahead and take a deal, get out, and I'll talk to an attorney and see if we can't vacate the judgment. But there's different reasons, including problems with the system, why someone would falsely take responsibility when they think that otherwise with an attorney I could defend it. Yeah, I mean, the obvious ones are, of course, you know, we, we get false confessions when people are, are, you know, threatened with violence and things like that. Obviously, law enforcement can't do that in the United States. But there are, you know, places where uh, people um, are made to confess because the, the, op- the, uh, the alternative is, uh, you know, you're going to be tortured or there's going to be other threats. They're going to threaten family uh, members, those sorts of things. And, of course, those are all bases for, you know, that confession to be thrown out later, um, you know, in a judicial process or proceeding. But, but yeah, the, the, um, and then you also get the folks who will, it's notoriety, right? So, so if it's a high profile case, like this case is a high profile case, you will get, and I'm sure that uh, the Boulder Police Department has gotten a number of people who have called and, you know, uh, reported that they are the suspect. And this is often you see individuals that suffer from a delusional disorder uh, and other you know serious mental illnesses that will will offer this up. And usually investigators can rule those out pretty quickly because what they're going to do is they're going to ask questions that only the suspect would know about uh, specific facts related to the crime that are not available or known to the public. You know, very intimate facts. You know, specific uh, injuries, things like that, that only only the suspect would know um, where they were inflicted. And they can generally rule out most most of those as they're not they're not valid. Since we're talking about John Bonet, that was really the scenario that John Mark Carr fell into. He was anonymously communicating with a professor at the University of Colorado there in Boulder, it, uh, the, a professor in the College of Media. His name was well, is Michael Tracy. And so over time, the details of, you know, his writings about the crime scene, about the victim seemed to get more and more detailed. So Professor Tracy, you know, tipped this off to the Boulder police and they believed it sounded like this was an individual that had personal knowledge about the crime. So they fashioned together a, an arrest warrant and, you know, did whatever they had to do with Interpol and had the guy arrested in Bangkok, Thailand, brought him to L.A. and California for extradition proceedings where he pled not guilty to uh, first degree murder, kidnapping and sexual assault of a minor. And 
you know, of course, he goes through and pleads not guilty, gets shipped to uh, Boulder, Colorado. Over time, they determined it was a false confession. And he'll admit, because he has a website page, he admits the reason why he was excluded is his DNA did not match DNA found at the crime scene. But I also understand it's because he was not available in Boulder at the time. At the time of the murder, you know, December 25th, 1996, he was in Atlanta. If he's at Atlanta, he's completely eliminated as a likely suspect because he had no means to commit the crime. He was nowhere near the proximity of the crime. So that completely eliminates him, regardless of whatever his desires are to keep himself linked to this case, which it seems like still to this day, it was only a few months. A few months ago that his name came up in the news cycle again, alluding or suggesting he did still have knowledge about the crime and said he's protecting somebody. Well, what does that even mean? But it's clearly not that he's responsible for this. That's pretty much a foregone conclusion at this point. So that that's I, I would be curious to know whether he has been evaluated or if, if anyone has formally evaluated him to see whether or not he you know, is suffering from any sort of psychiatric disorder, because this is likely what my, what's going on here. There's this need, obviously, to be connected somehow to this. Right. And clearly the evidence, the physical evidence and now the fact that there's, yes, alibi evidence, meaning he's like he's in a completely different state. If that's established, you know, by by evidence, then. And and if he's confronted with this and, and he still, you know, firmly believes he has involvement, we call that a delusion, right? That's a false belief. When you're given evidence to the contrary, you still firmly believe this to be true. And with delusions and when people and delusions are just kind of one symptom of a broader psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, uh, or it could just be a standalone sort of thing, too. So. You know, those are things that should be looked at in in any of these cases when you when it's unclear, you know, whether is this confession valid, you know, is do we have corroborating evidence? Like you said before, do we have additional evidence linking this defendant, this suspect to the crime independent of just the confession? As an attorney, I would be, you know, if I'm defending somebody in a criminal case, if the confession is all they have. One of my jobs would be, if if in ten we were, we were intending to take the case to trial, would be to somehow get the confession thrown out. And there's ways of doing that. Even if a, a defendant or a suspect waives their Miranda rights, if they're in custody and law enforcement intends to interrogate them, that's the prong. It's a two prong test, right? Custody plus interrogation equals uh, Miranda warning. It's universal. We have to do that. And even post waiver. That does not necessarily mean that a confession will come in because if right. there's any coercion, coercion um, being used in that process, threats, anything like that, even subtle threats, then those could be grounds for getting that confession completely thrown out under a suppression motion. Right. And, you know, that's where, you know, the origin of Miranda comes about because implicit in interviewing or interrogation while in custody, implicitly you know, at risk is two of the constitutional protections that you have, a right to remain silent, which if you're not advised of that, that's per se a violation. And the other one, you have a right to have counsel. So this is a formal process between an arm of the government, the executive branch, and they're putting you at risk of your liberty. So, you know, that's the origin of Miranda, which its predecessor, I really have fallen in love with. It's the Escobedo uh, assertion from a case, uh, Escobedo versus Illinois. It was a 1964 case. And let me just quote. Right before Miranda came out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you understand the significance of why I like the Escobedo assertion. It really plays a, a genuine part in this discussion because you're comparing confessions with evidence, right? And evidence seems to be more reliable than a confession. Well, the Escobedo court said uh, in their ruling, we have learned the lesson of history, ancient and modern, that a system of criminal enforcement, which comes to depend on the confession, will, in the long run, be less reliable and more subject to abuses than a system which depends on extrinsic evidence independently secured through skillful investigation. You know, 
clearly the investigation, the evidence derived from that is more reliable than, you know, what we're talking about, a confession where you don't know if it's genuine or not. So you have to be able to vet that. So it's always been my position that if you're going to take a confession, you still have to make sure that the evidence corroborates that confession or, you know, you may be in, imprisoning somebody that's truly innocent, which is bad enough. And that's where I like all the exoneration, all the case law that's come about from DNA analysis overturning these convictions. But it's even goes beyond that because it's bad enough that an innocent person goes to prison for a crime they didn't commit. But you're leaving the real perpetrator at large. And we know that if it's a a type of offender that will reoffend over and over, like a pedophile or, you know, like a serial killer, you don't want them at large. You don't want to just close the case for the sake of closing it because you got a confession. The public is still at risk because the true killer is free to co- commit other crimes. Yeah, they stop their investigation, you know, uh, general. I mean, they, that yeah. investigation ends, you know, once they secure a uh, either an indictment or, you know, formal charges are filed by a prosecuting attorney. Yeah. And it's it's interesting because in line with the, you know, false confession literature, you know, the research has looked at this, we see parallels in eyewitness testimony as in terms of the uh, the unreliability of eyewitness testimony. And it's it's, you know, it's in a similar vein. We have a lot of evidence that um, eyewitnesses are unreliable as well uh, in in terms of what they actually you know report what they actually saw uh, because uh, memory is so is reconstructive um, and remember when you know when when someone's being interviewed and interrogated they're also relying on memory and recollection of events and things and memory is not reliable uh, memory is not like a a video that we we take and then we replay it when we when we recall the memory it's reconstructive in nature so people who want to learn more about the unreliability of eyewitness uh, testimony uh, need to look at the work of Elizabeth Loftus uh, is a, a, a permanent researcher in um, in false memory essentially she's got a, a long line of research that started back in the 1970s uh, that has looked at this extensively and uh, I just remember all of the investigations that I conducted. I always remembered that you get eyewitness statements reporting what they saw. And you, you get different witnesses at the same scene. They're reporting different variations of, of what actually happened. And that, that just demonstrates, you know, the unreliability of that. You know how you brought up uh, delusions as, as something that would create uh, someone to do a false uh, statement to take responsibility for like John Bonet's case. The other reason that can be present here is fame, you know, hunting. They want to have that notoriety. It's pretty well established from John Mark Carr's criminal history that he's got pedophilic interests. So if you're going to have convictions for possession of child pornography and things of that nature, and you're not shy about it to be the king daddy responsible for the ultimate child predation you know why not take responsibility for jumbane and be their king oh yeah notoriety definitely i know dana has something to say about that with regard to you know narcissism and how that might play a role into you know why people might be motivated to do this to admit or confess to things that they have not done yeah jason and i were talking about this earlier today and yesterday motives of people and you know these are pedophiles that have a very specific interest in children and i don't think the public always fully understands pedophiles in this case i just want to say the public perception was largely clouded by the police and the news at the time and they put out information that they wanted the public to believe or think not all the information was put out there and certain information was, but it led to a certain belief system about who was responsible for this. And as we know, and you can read the comments on any of these podcasts or YouTube videos, there are people that have clearly made up their mind even before they're willing to look at the evidence 
Now, as we're talking about delusions, which can be a false belief, there's different other psychological phenomenons for why people can believe certain things to be true, like not just in addition to pretending to have committed this crime and trying to convince people of it. That can be associated with different personality disorders and attention seeking. But what about these other people in the public who kind of this bandwagon effect? One of the things that I find that was corroborating is if you recall in the first line of the ransom note, it says, listen carefully, which linguistically is, is inconsistent with a written instruction. You would think it would be read yeah. carefully. Read carefully, yeah. Because that's an auditory command as opposed to you know a, a written command. Yeah. So one of the things that stood out to me is like, well, that's, that's illogical. Why are you saying listen carefully in a written instrument? So I asked Michael Vail to go through his other letters to see that same language used. Bingo, there was. Interesting. Yeah. So, cons- yeah. so it's consistent. I mean, obviously, it doesn't prove anything, but right. it shows that this is unique to that author. And if they're the same yeah, author. Writing, yeah, it's a writing style. Yeah, the, it's a writing the, style. Because you know, yeah, he's yeah. not thinking through it that, uh-huh. that it should say read carefully. And he's just used to saying it that way in writing. Obviously, some of the other details were he knew she died on the 26th, not the 25th. She knew she was riding a bike uh, on Christmas Day. We also know that he described to Michael in a phone call that it was on 5 by 8 legal pad instead of the 8 and a half by 11. And it was yellow, where most people think because it's a photocopy Oh, yeah, it was on white. white paper. Well, no, it was this size, and the killer would know that. Well, Gary knew that. So it's stuff like that that stands yeah. out to us, why Real stuff. it's corroborated by his, his statements in other capacities, that he knows stuff about the crime that the killer would know. Now, obviously, you can make the argument, well, if the, if the size was mentioned in news coverage, that maybe he learned it that way. But that is an explanation why somebody other than the killer may know a detail. And in my opinion, he's obsessed with John Monet, not obsessed with the case. There's a distinction. Like uh-huh. Web Sleuths might know that it was, you know, the size of paper, but the killer doesn't know. He doesn't give two shits about it. He's not Googling the size of the the, the document yeah. because he already knows. He knows, yeah. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, we've been venturing to corroborate, you know, the confession, not just relying on the confession standing alone. So I just wanted to mention about biases and people have biases, whether you know it or not. And you can have an implicit bias, and not even be consciously aware of it. And I did want to point out that the Ramsey family, when they moved to Boulder, Colorado, I mean, they had a 7,000 square foot house. Mr. Ramsey hit a billion dollar in his business the year before. There was wealth, which was very different in that town. So they were rich. And I think some people judged them harshly or discriminated against them or made assumptions about how they acted, how they dressed. And I know that people close to them had wonderful things to say about them, but people who didn't know them, and we're talking about public perception, I didn't know them. So on the media, the media painted it in such a way to make you maybe not believe their authenticity or start to to pick apart certain things you saw in their behaviors or actions or mannerisms or statements And you didn't have all the evidence because not all the evidence was put out there on TV. We know this because initially in the 90s, there was certain information that was public and other information that was not put out there. We know this. And now more information is being revealed. And now we have information, right, that I previously didn't know. But can people change their perception about this case? What is so difficult for people, they're becoming attached to certain information and talking about confirmation bias, where you look at only information to support your theory and not look at new information 
or evidence or admission that's in front of you to consider a different alternative. And I think it's dangerous. And John Ramsey said this in an interview. He said, there's nothing more dangerous than a police department who's made up their mind. And he went on to say a lot of other statements, but he said tunnel vision existed from day one. And I want to go to Craig and ask, you've been a police officer. Tell me about why this is a problem and how this happens in police investigations. Well, it goes to the issue of human nature, right? So, uh, you know, what you spoke about with confirmation bias, that's one of several sort of biases that just human beings have just generally. So that's sort of a, a wiring issue, right, in terms of the way the brain operates. It is true that we look for, if we have a predetermined sort of conclusion about something, in other words, we believe this person committed this crime or whatever, um, we're going to only look for that evidence that supports that. I saw that so many times in both criminal investigations, but I also saw it in internal investigations that happened in the organization and the department itself. As I, I was involved with uh, defending officers who were um, who were being investigated um, for you know, administrative things, and I would see evidence of this in terms of the way that the investigators would do their investigations. Confirmation bias was was happening frequently, not all the time, but uh, I did see it and. I saw it in um, in investigative work as well, you know, and, and I, it's not it's not an intentional thing per se. I don't think that investigators are out there saying I'm, you know, I'm intending to, you know, prove my point. This is my this is the conclusion. I'm only you know, I'm only going to look for the evidence that supports it. It's sort of a it's it's under the surface. It's sort of like you don't pay attention to certain things that are salient or are relevant to an investigation, and you're you're not keeping that open mind. Um, not that you're doing it on purpose, but if it's not consistent with your theory, then you're less likely to pay attention to it. And when you're less likely to pay attention to it, you know it doesn't get put. It doesn't become part of that investigative follow up, right? It doesn't become that. I'm going to go talk to this other person, or I'm going to go over and look uh, look in this area for for evidence and so on. So does that. And I think Jason probably has something to say about this as well. You know, in all the years of work you've done in in, in private investigative work as well, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, in it's... fact, uh, you know, bring it back to John Bonet. It, there was really just primarily two pieces of evidence that steered uh, law enforcement down the wrong path to blame Patsy specifically, and that was number one that the window downstairs in the basement was already broken. And it was admitted to when the detective came up and asked about it. And he says, I broke it, you know, in the fall when I locked myself out of the house accidentally. But the difference was it was open and not just broken. And there was no discussion about that. And then when John went downstairs and saw that the window was open, you know, that was a red flag for him. The other aspect about the investigation that really led them to believe it was a family member was they're looking at the ransom note and they're seeing that it's on a specific size paper. So they asked the Ramseys to collect all their stationery together so they could, you know, look at it, either rule it out or confirm their suspicions. But they learned that the ransom note was written on a notepad that was taken from the kitchen. And it was on five by eight junior legal pad, and they saw across the top, across the serration, that somebody had initially started the note saying Mister and Mrs. R, and then realized that it was below the serration, so they started the note again, and those three pages were peeled off and left at the bottom rung of the spiral staircase, that led police then to think that. Wow, somebody wrote the note inside the house, and they're thinking that because it was three pages on the smaller paper, that it seemed to be unusually long. So their thought process was somebody was comfortable and took time to write this note in the house, but who'd be more comfortable than someone that lives in the house? So they contrived this theory that for whatever reason, whether it be an accident protecting a you know the other child in the home or whatever, they staged the basement to look like a failed abduction, and that 
the ransom note was disingenuous and that it was actually all just, you know, to steer law enforcement away of accusing one of the family members. That set the stage for them to spend the rest of these years focused on the family alone. And they wanted to build a case central around the, the ransom note in the ransom note alone. In fact, it was intriguing to me that May 31st, 2000, there was a CNN episode of Larry King Live that had both Steve Thomas at that moment in time, the former detective that was the lead investigator on the case, together on the show with John and Patsy Ramsey. And they debated and argued back and forth about the case. What was unanimously agreed to during that episode was that Steve Thomas said that this was not a DNA case and offered that the only, you know, that whoever wrote the ransom note was the guilty person that was responsible for John Bonet's death. The Ramseys agreed with him and said, yeah, whoever wrote the ransom note is the killer. So fast forward to what we know now, my investigation has revealed that the handwriting of uh, Gary Oliva matches the ransom note, you know, and that's through three different handwriting analysts that they all concur for whatever approach, whatever system that they deployed, they all came to the same conclusion that there's a high probability that Gary Oliva wrote the ransom note and the sample that they're, you know, relying on is what we could describe as being the coupon letter. The coupon letter was a, a letter written in mid-1990, like 95, 96, that was written by Gary Oliva to his high school classmate, Michael Vell. And from that, there's over 22 different letter characters out of the alphabet that they've matched up. And it's really rare that they have that luxury of a single page, eight and a half by 11, that they can take all those writing samples and do overlays. And they're near identical matches where usually you could take a stack of papers and they cherry pick a letter from this page, a letter from that page. But so many examples that they compared to were just a single page to this two and a half page ransom note. So we feel confident that not only do we have the confession statements, we also have the handwriting match. And we didn't even stop at that. We've gone further beyond that to, to, to look at other aspects. There's over 200 recorded phone calls looking for things that were stated about the crime or about John Bonet that maybe only the killer would know. Uh, from those recordings, we have him describing that the, that the ransom note was on a junior size a yellow pad. And it's like, well, the killer would know that. And maybe some researcher might know that if it was revealed in the media, you know, newspaper or something down the line. But to, I want you to be clear to understand that Gary Oliva is obsessed with John Bonet, not the John Bonet murder investigation like Web Sleuths or our chair uh, detectives are going to be. They may know something from research, but that doesn't mean that the killer is researching the case only if he's trying to contrive you know, falsely that he's responsible and, and make a false confession. But here we got plenty of tangible evidence that tying Gary Oliva to the crime, including some of the the language that was used depicted in the ransom note. For example, the first line in the ransom note says, listen carefully. Well, this is a written document, not a phone conversation or a you know, something that's a verbal, like a verbal command that I might say if I was a police officer on the corner directing traffic. To write it, listen carefully is, you know, is erroneous. You would write, read carefully, because that's what you're using. You're using your eyes, not your ears. So there's nothing to listen to. You're reading it. So it should have said, read carefully. And that was one of the first clues that I asked uh, Michael to go through his collection of letters from Gary over the years to see if he has also written, listen carefully, in some other writings to him. And 
And sure enough, he found another example where he said, listen, careful. And he was talking about his court proceeding that was coming up and he wanted, you know, Michael to do something for him. But he said, listen, carefully. And something else that really stood out to me about his writings, and, and that is, if you, re, if you remember in the ransom note, one of the threats that were made to the Ramses was, you know, don't talk to the police, don't talk to the FBI, or, or she dies. Specifically, one of the things that were stated was, you know, that she would be beheaded. And, you know, and psychologists have claimed that if a family member was staging this, they wouldn't want to write that, you know, something so gruesome would happen to their child if this was a staged letter. You just simply would say, you know, that that you won't get her back or something. But to 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 say something so disgusting, so unlikely heinous that, you know, you're imagining your daughter beheaded. You know, many uh, psychologists have explained to me that that's not likely to be a statement. But looking at Gary's other letters, we know that he's artistic and he's done drawings. Many of his drawings depict his characters beheaded. One of them was he uh, drew Mickey Mouse beheaded. He's drawn Dumbo the Clown. I mean, I'm sorry. He's drawn Dumbo the Elephant beheaded. He's drawn... Dora the Explorer beheaded. He's drawn a Disney princess holding a shrunken beheaded head. So this is a man that's obsessed with beheadings. And the author of the ransom note described a beheading. We find that to be consistent, that him having these fantasies or these drawings of beheadings is consistent with the author of the ransom note. Uh, yeah, I, the most compelling um, evidence that you just spoke to, the, in terms of what I see, it is is this these these handwriting exemplars that you, when you in terms of the reference sample you talk about that one letter uh, for three and these are three independent and I'm assuming blinded meaning that they that each of these experts didn't know the results from the previous expert that reviewed the 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 sample is that is that correct like the three people these are three independent experts handwriting experts that looked at the letters it, yeah they're not in the same office or anything like that they each independently did their own analysis and when they say high probability right that this is coming from the same writer the same author um, i'm assuming that probability you know is in the that beyond reasonable doubt category in other words that that area of you know, it's hard to put an actual probability, but when we talk beyond reasonable doubt, we're talking in the 95 to 99 percent, you know, probability range or higher. Right. That's pretty compelling uh, just because handwriting is like a fingerprint to some, some extent. It's it's it, it's unique and it can be um, quite persuasive, you know, from an evidentiary standpoint in terms of building that case. I mean, it's one piece of evidence, but there's other pieces of evidence here that seem to be fitting together. Right. Yeah. In fact, uh... you know. What was explained to me, the only way they they could feel comfortable going higher on their scaling is if they had the original ransom note, because then you can look at pressure and you can see where uh, they started in the paper, but you can't see pressure on a photocopy. And uh, it was also explained to me that they would, you know, give it a one if they knew that they wrote it because they observed the writing, but then that's not analysis. That's an actual eyewitness account. So, you know, it's as high as you can get not using an original to compare to. Gary Oliva, is he, my understanding is he's still in custody somewhere, right? He's, is he incarcerated uh, in a, in he, a he you know, was institution in, somewhere? He was convicted of child possession, child pornography in 2016, and he was supposed to do 10 years. He completed eight years, and he was just released from prison on January 31st. So he's out now. I would have loved to have had an interview with him during that time. But now he's out on the street, and he is a registered sex offender. So he is required to check in with his PO, and he has to have an address on file. And so he is, and like we were talking earlier about people 
who, if you talk to them long enough, they do like to talk. And a lot of people, when we talk about admissions, and if we were to sit down with Gary, which I would love to, I have found in my time of interviewing people that if you talk to someone long enough, they want to be heard. They like to talk about themselves. If you if you're a good listener, and they'll eventually just talk more about themselves or reveal things. The truth kind of comes out uh, about who he is. And I would find it interesting if over time, you know, building a relationship with him and talking. I, I know that as a psychologist, I have had people make admissions to me that maybe they didn't intend to or plan to, but then they did over time with just feeling like a comfortable space to talk about it. And I wonder how close that Gary is going to get to a place where typically in my experience, like they want to share their side of the story. A lot of times if it's, they, they want to share their side that hasn't been heard, you know, whether it was accidental or he loved her, he was infatuated or, you know, he's sorry. He wants to share he he's truly a man obsessed with a child. He's a pedophile, he's a registered sex offender who has child porn with pictures of John Bidet, hundreds of them. And I know we're talking about evidence, but I know he's been found to have a taser in his backpack before, along with child porn, which... Interesting combo, yeah. I know it's... we haven't talked about the autopsy because a lot of times we're focusing in on DNA evidence, which we kind of talked about in the first episode, and then there's handwriting analysis. But the the autopsy in itself is revealing, and there was a taser expert who found what they believe to be that John Bonet Ramsey was tasered in two areas. And that's very specific evidence that I I don't hear a lot of people talking about, but it's very incriminating that Gary just is riding around with his backpack with a taser. Right, right. In fact, uh, one of the recordings in the the jail conversations, he talks about the taser, that the taser was given to him by a friend, a woman that was, you know, worried about his protection. And that's the origin of the, the taser. So he had a taser. So, you know, the fact is that the autopsy, uh, you know, the medical examiner believed that she had been tased. One of your suspects, your primary persons of interest, actually owned a, a taser and was arrested in 2000 in possession of a taser. It seems to you know, corroborate again that he's likely the, the suspect that's responsible because he has all the elements that ties into the particular crime at issue, including one of the other things that was brought, you know, that brought about in all the revelations from law enforcement. And that was the fact that she had black duct tape across her mouth. And John, when he describes finding her, the first thing he did is ripped off the duct tape and picks her up and then runs her upstairs where uh, Detective Linda Art is, you know, ups upstairs on the main floor. What's intriguing is they searched the house. So their primary suspect was a family member, namely Patsy is what they really focused on. But nowhere in the house is duct tape. The following year, though, on the one year anniversary, there's a candlelight vigil and they got images of Gary being at that vigil. Eyewitnesses at that vigil say he had a large envelope and, you know, they thought he was weird. He was using an alias at that, you know, vigil. On the back side of that uh, envelope was black duct tape. So again, another piece of the crime that it's not, you know, so close in proximity that you can say unequivocally that Gary's duct tape was the same duct tape that he, you know, it could have been another role. It could be a coincidence. But the totality of all the evidence is what we're going to look at to make a case against the guy, not just one element at a time. And you can explain any one character of an offense 
you can explain it away standing alone. It's all of the facts, all of the evidence that builds a case against the suspect because it's all of that evidence that comes forward. And, and they can do forensics on that duct tape and say what kind of brand it was and what kind of adhesive is used if they got possession of it. And, and what they should have done, rather than that tunnel vision that you brought up, Dana, where they were tunnel focused on, on uh, Patsy or the Ramsey in general, had they re- reacted to Michael Bell's tip on the evening of the 26th of December, 1996, and they went and found the guy and they brought him in for questioning and they developed, uh, you know, facts for a, uh, affidavit for a warrant they might have collected the duct tape in real time they might have you know searched a backpack and found a taser that that the prongs all line up to the burn marks on on john Bonet's cheek and neck or her back there's so many things that they could have done and, and made an, a much much stronger case in 1996 than And I want to reiterate what you're saying, just to repeat it for clarity for everyone. So back in 96, Gary Oliva was a classmate of Michael Bell. So Gary confides in him, right, on December 26, crying, confessing that he accidentally killed John Bonet. What he did was he called up that night, and and in uh, Michael's time in, in California, about it was between 11 and 12 o'clock at night. Michael gets a phone call and he answers, and it's Gary on the other line. He recognizes his voice, and Gary's completely distraught and he's hyperventilating between his words. And he says, I heard a little girl. And you know, that's alarming to Michael. He's like, Oh, well, what, what's going on? What are, what's, where are you at? And he learns from Gary, that he's in Boulder, which is a shock to him because the last time he heard from Gary through correspondence that he was up in Oregon. Now you're in in Boulder, Colorado. Well, they had other friends from high school that moved from California to Boulder. So, you know, obviously, Gary, when he absconded from his parole up in Oregon, because he had that 1990. Uh, conviction for molesting a, a seven-year-old, he leaves the jurisdiction of Oregon. You know, at that point in time when he was living in Boulder, there's a warrant for his arrest because he's absconded and he's hiding out in Boulder and he's couch surfing between different friends that were going to the University of Colorado there in Boulder. So, my gosh, it's like you got all this consistent criminal history. And all these possession of elements or components that would cause injuries or whatever relating to the the victim, you got the fact that his uh, victim uh, type typology is also in his history. He's a convicted pedophile. When he's arrested in 2016, he's got hundreds of, of violent depictions of child pornography where there's violence against victims, and he also has depictions of 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 John Bonet in various settings alive and also the autopsy photos. So all of these are aligned in his device where it's violence against, you know, children and violence against John Bonet. They're they're not separate. They're the same. Yeah. What you've described, Jason, is a um, wealth of circumstance of strong circumstantial evidence. You know, there's, you know, in in criminal cases, we look at direct evidence, we look at circumstantial evidence. And I can tell you that that prosecutors can put a case together with circumstantial evidence. They don't. And oftentimes they don't have direct direct evidence would be something like DNA, you know, blood, uh, you know, physical evidence that directly links, right, the defendant, the suspect to the crime. But circumstantial evidence is what you're describing. All of this here, um, it's really it's strong. strong. I mean, it's it's. I mean, yeah, it, it is. Uh, that's just my impression of it. Uh, now, you know, a prosecutor look, might look at it and say, "Well, it's still not enough, right?" They would want the confession, obviously, taken by uh, an investigator. Well, that's clearly what we hope for, and that's really one of the reasons why we're here. Is if we can steer public perception away from the bias that, you know, have been instilled in many of the, you know, 
true crime followers of John Monet's case, that if we can create some public, uh, you know, uh, some public awareness, some public, uh, you know, some encouragement from the public to do something about it, that maybe Boulder PD, maybe the Boulder DA will act upon it because you do have public interest in pursuing Gary and eliminate him once and for all, rather than leave the this unanswered question blooming out there as if, you know, the story doesn't exist, that Gary didn't exist, that there's all these cir- all these circumstances surrounding Gary as a person of interest. And the only thing that they're thinking that eliminates him is the lack of DNA tying him directly to the case. Well, just like gloves avoids leaving fingerprints at a crime scene, Wearing coats, wearing gloves, and also dissuade leaving DNA at the crime scene. So, uh, in 1996, the primary sources of DNA evidence was body fluids like blood, semen, saliva. Fast forward where touch DNA becomes a thing. You can't really go after the fact and do touch DNA analysis, trace DNA several years or a decade later, it may not be conclusive. Nowadays, you know, I commit a, you know, a heinous crime today, the touch DNA is so sensitive and so uh, advanced that they can do rapid DNA testing right now off of something I leave behind at the crime scene, like, like in the Brian Koberger case, where there was a life, uh, a knife sheath left behind, they were able to tie that knife sheath to him because his DNA was on the snap at the top of the sheath. So, had that been, or, or his father's DNA, right? So yeah, had, his father's DNA, right, right. and they can amplify that obviously right. with it. But had that been ten years later, maybe that would not be the outcome. Yeah, and in 1996, you know that DNA was just emerging, right? right? Evidence DNA evidence was just emerging and. We didn't have touch DNA back then, and, and nowadays, you know, when when any crime scene, it, when evidence technicians go in there, that they're right. they're swabbing everything, right? They're looking for that touch DNA on doorknobs, on you know any any object that that the suspect may have have handled, and they can amplify those tiny amount of that material is all right, they need, right, and they right. can amplify it. Well, the police said in two thousand and two that DNA excluded him. Because his DNA was not found at the crime scene. That being said, you know, like I said earlier, Steve Thomas said this is not a DNA case. He said that experts that are DNA experts have said this is not a DNA case. Why is it that in 2000 it's not a DNA case, but then can be developed into one thereafter is going to have to be explained because the lead investigator on the case admitted to the public on Larry King Life that it was not a DNA case. That would mean that if there's question whether or not DNA will actually prove the you know the case one way or the other, you look to other evidence. The next biggest piece of evidence in this case uniquely is going to be that ransom note in the handwriting. So I would think that no matter who you find, You'll want to compare the handwriting to see if it matches, no matter what, regardless. And, you know, we know that they've done a second round or third round of DNA testing. We know that just recently they concluded DNA testing. And the Colorado Cold Case Review Board recommended to Boulder PD, and it was released in a, in a press release from Boulder PD, they recommend that they wait you know, for DNA technology to come around uh, on the DNA testing. And what I believe that is from the experts I've talked to is the next big, you know, evolution of DNA testing is the the ability to deconvolute mixtures. So they go through now and they use them back and they collect DNA samples and they put that DNA onto a filter. And then from the filter, they can you know, get a profile. If they sucked up my DNA, your DNA, and some other from an article of clothing or something, that creates a mixture. And they have to be able to 
unmix those mixed samples so they can know this profile is this, this profile is that, rather than you don't know which allele bill it is attributed to this profile or, or otherwise. So we're waiting for that technology, Nick. And if that technology never comes up, then DNA is never going to really solve this case. So they really should focus on all the evidence, not just one aspect. But we do know that DNA has arisen to be the primary source for solving cases because it has that scientific evidentiary value where, you know, sometimes science is, is not just beyond a reasonable doubt, but scientific proof can be absolute in many regards. But because it's unknown DNA, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's suspect DNA. We're talking something that's come, come about after the fact rather than in real time or since the technology is in place. So there's a, a good possibility or probability that the DNA that they're looking at that's unknown male might be a handler that's innocently attributed, whether it be a detective, a lab handler, uh, you know, a, an expert, somebody from the, the police department, the, the evidence room or whatever, because we don't know the history of the article of clothing that they're testing since, you know, December 26, 1996. We don't know how many people have handled that. We don't know after the DNA testing where they actually had a blood a stain on the apparel, whether they thought after testing the first time that, oh, well, we don't have to worry about it anymore. We can manhandle this because it's already been tested. We don't know that, you know, what was in the psyche of the handlers at the time after it was tested. As opposed to now, we know that protocols are you replace gloves frequently, but up until that moment, you would put on gloves simply to prevent you from adding your prints to the crime scene. And that means you may not replace your gloves at all. So if I touch this, then I touch that. Now I run the risk of transferring something that I picked up here and transpo transposed it to there, as opposed to, oh, I've handled this. I better de-glove, re-glove before I touch this, because that's how transfer happens. And that's and and that's the reason there's there's strict chain of custody, you know, logs that are kept anytime evidence is handled, removed, test taken off for testing, ret returned. There's a strict chain of custody uh, record. That way, if you have contamination, then you can rule out. You know who who is in there. You can rule those people out. I mean, if if perhaps, like you said, you know, some evidence tech or something mistakenly like some some DNA cells sloughed off, right, and got on got onto the article and then contaminated it, which can happen. That can be big right. and big can be ruled out. Well, let's talk about another case of a another girl named Amy that happened in nineteen ninety seven in Boulder, Colorado. That's an unsolved case that it's something we could look at into deeper. So sure, I sure. wanna say People that are pedophiles that chronically offend and they have a specific belief system that they have a right to have sex with children or do these things. It's a this is not in question with Gary. This is part of who he is and his lifestyle. He committed, he's been convicted, and he is willing to abscond from the law and be on the run, feel brazen enough to do it again, or continue to violate the law, have child porn, right? And so that sounds like a high-risk person who is likely to do it again. It's not a behavior. I mean, he's actively... So he got released early. He's only been released for a very short amount of time. Like, he's going to continue to have urges. He is going to possess child pornography one way or the other. I mean being on parole, being a registered sex offender, these people get access to that, right? They're not accounted for 24-7, right? They have check-in points. And so it's not going to be enough. And the sad part about these cases is that they do recommit their crimes. And then, like, but how many does it take before? But how many does it take? Because we already are convicted. Right. And you do time and it's not enough. 
what I have questions for is, you know, as sex offender evaluations or risk assessments, like how, how is this continuing to happen? I know as an evaluator for the court, we do sex offender evaluations or, or risk assessments. And <laughs> now Craig's going to look it up. But... Well, I'm looking up to see, because you're, you're bringing up a, a point about whether, and I don't know this uh, yet, but I'm going to find out. Does Oregon actually have an SVP statute, which is a sexually violent predator statute, which allows states that have those statutes to deal with these folks in a way where, no, oh, you serve your time, that's fine. But guess what? You, you're, we still think you're a risk to the community and we're going to civilly commit you because you have a paraphilic disorder. You are a pedophile. We have we have this, we have the, it's a diagnosis, folks. This is a DSM. It's a diagnosis. It's a disorder. And these folks can be committed indefinitely, right? We do these evaluations all the time. And I have evaluated a person on civil commitment for, as a sexually violent predator. I evaluated this person in the state hospital and he would rape five-year-olds. That was his fetish and that he did many times. At some point he was released and did it again. I went to interview him to see if he's ready for release. The thing about people is they tell who they are. He told me how he would have sex with a five-year-old and how he would do it again and how children do it different than adults. And when he was released before, he would wait for children to get off the school bus, right? And this was his fantasy and he was going to act it out. And I would ask him, well, how would a five-year-old have sex? And then he explained it to me. And so he's just being honest. He's telling me, and obviously I'm writing all this down and I'm acknowledging his risk to reoffend is high and he's rationalizing it. And the these evaluations are important. This process is important. Those are people that aren't safe to be in society. They're not. And um, so... Just so you know, like, so he, he was in prison in Oregon, correct? Oregon does have sexually violent, dangerous offender law. They, they have it, ORS 137.765. However, they classify you as a level one, two, or three offender. So if you're a one or two, you're not considered uh, predatory. Or if you're not a predatory or a sexually violent offender, you are not, there are no restrictions. In other words, you do your time, you get released. For a level three, they do impose restrictions, meaning that they could be subject to being evaluated and potentially ex- be committed to a forensic state forensic hospital. This is what's interesting about all of this that I think the listeners might be interested to know. Wherever you live, you better take a look at your, st- your state statutes and see whether or not your state actually has these statutes in place to protect the public against these these predators, these sexual, what Dr. Anderson's talking about, um, which is, you know, these folks who are, who have a pedophilic interests, they are, um, they are preying on children. These folks are not amenable. We, we have, the treatment literature is pretty clear. Um, treatment is inconsistent in terms of whether it works or not. And I have an opinion about that. And I, I don't know, I'm less confident that treatment is effective. Um, some will, some will disagree. I, I happen to not agree with that. And I think that, um, when you've got someone that has, has this and they, they clearly can't stop this impulsive behavior, um, they should not be released. That's just my, that's my position on that. But, um, so yeah, it, 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 he, perhaps he wasn't, you know, evaluated because he's considered level one or two in Oregon. I don't know. I don't know what, how they classified him. Jason might know, but, um, but that's something that people should be aware of when they're because all states are different. You know, uh, I don't remember how many states actually have these laws, but there are several states that don't actually have any of these laws in place. You know, and going back to to this Amy girl, the the, the other unsolved rape. There's some similarities about that case where where they claim they believe that the perpetrator was waiting in the home. That's really where the Ramsey's position were that. This attacker was waiting in the house for them to go to bed. The differences are, is that um, Amy, you know, which isn't her real name, it was the name given her for the article, but Amy was a teenager. 
whereas John Bonet is prepubescent. So oftentimes, you know, pedophiles, just like everybody else that have, you know, fetishes or desires of adults, they have a type. What's unique about John Bonet is the fact that Gary Oliva's previous 1990 victim fits the same type. Seven versus six is, you know, a year difference, but we're talking blonde. Everything about his prior victim matches the description of, I've gotten a photo of that victim and eerily they look similar. That's vitally important and know this just from doing hundreds of sex assault investigations and, and child molestation cases. Um, these these predators, um, they have object choices that are age ranges, age range gen- generally specific. So so what you speak to about, you know, whether this victim is six or seven generally is not, that's in that range that you generally see. Um, and yes, uh, you know, uh, interviewing uh, hundreds of these these people, um, they they talk about that. They talk about preferences in in terms of I like them, you know, eleven to twelve or eleven to thirteen, or I like them, you know, in certain. And there's usually an age range that that's reported. Um, now there's some that are more versatile in terms of you know any prepubescent age is fine, you know, but that's less frequent. But but absolutely, um, there are. That's well established that when we evaluate a pedophile, you know, we generally do see that see that they have a preference, they have an object choice in terms of when I say object, I mean like the a the this is their ideal, um, this is what gives them the sexual gratification, this is what get you know is is what they seek. We can there's all kinds of uh, explanatory models perhaps as to why that happens, and that goes into a, a, a psychodynamic thing that I'm not uh, interested in discussing, um, but. In terms of like, well, what you know, what causes this? Yeah, I'm not even not even going to get into it. That that that's that's I wanted to make that point that um, that when you see that, that's part of that circumstantial pattern, right? That you know that provides additional evidence. Well, and I wanted to mention a lot of people think of Gary as a stranger, but not so much. I think he had familiarity with. The family and observing John Bonet or watching her or even stalking her obsessions with her that began before. And this girl, Amy, here's her alleged name, went to dance school with John Bonet Ramsey. And so if you're watching one individual, you get to know all the people. And you could be picking a victim, like, or choosing one or multiple ones. Sometimes your victim could, you were targeting one, but this opportunity came up for the next closest thing, or maybe he was interested at that time, but the opportunity didn't present itself. And then at a later time it does, right? So, you know, it's very interesting and my heart goes out to the family, um, I know a lot of people have made judgments about parents that put their children in beauty pageants. And this was back in the 90s. And Patsy Ramsey was a beauty star herself. And so that was just something she loved. And I think it was something John Bonet loved too. Like just naturally liked to perform and was outgoing. And nowadays it's a lot more cautionary knowing what we know as parents. And there are predators out there and you do have to protect them if you choose to put them out there in these things, being a public image or being in beauty contests. Like even if you do everything you you can to protect them, they are still known publicly. And back in the day, the Ramses, in hindsight, they were just open about everything and they shared photos and had people to their house, had parties and just were innocent in that way. Uh, I don't think there was any ill intention, but there is p- other people have ill intentions. These sexual predators do, and they look for these opportunities to become obsessed with these pubescent girls or boys that are put out there. And that's the dangerous part. As this case unfolds, and I know, Jason, you're you're in on this case. There's a lot more you can't even say. And I'm thankful that you've 
taken this case on so passionately and you've put out your own expenses because you feel it's important and it is justice is important and i would encourage people to continue to ask questions we can do another series we can continue to talk about this just bring public awareness because part of this platform that we're on right now is creating awareness to critical issues and cases like this to to seek justice highlighting important cases and we're not just saying that only John Bonet's case is important it's important because the predator is still out there and it's hap- it's going to happen again and again until this person's caught right it's not just Gary Oliva like this is a continuing problem and there's plenty of cold cases out there that aren't getting attention but this case we're we're illustrating these points of why it is important right and who's handling the investigation public perception all of this and all the questions that we're asking i want the public to understand and be invested on public safety and think about how can we be part of the solution to this right we're using our time for free to talk about this because it matters and i want to prevent future victims and there's a lot of unsolved cold cases right now we have to have these conversations and so not just bring awareness to john bonet There's a lot of other unnamed individuals whose family does not want to go public for all the reasons. Do you understand all the reasons why this family doesn't want to go public? Look what happened to the Ramseys. Them as parents want to not have that happen to them. They've already gone through enough, so they're protecting themselves. And so I want to support those family too in time, you know, with whatever evidence they want to share. And we can collaborate to solve this case, but it's not just John Bonet. There's other victims as well, because these predators don't stop. So we we need to do better as exactly. a system. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Both of you guys are oh. awesome, and I will read one <laughs> comment from YouTube, and it's from Rise Up. Unafraid, it says, I love Jason. He's phenomenal. Well, that's not all caps. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great. I think that um, I appreciate you and both of you and in your input and your expertise and talking about this. And if you are wanting to retain Jason Jensen or Dr. Craig Wetter, we have all the information on the podcast. And if you sign up for the emails, I list all the websites and information there for you to follow up. And if you want to interview with either one of them or consult with them on other cold cases, we'd love to work with you. Thanks for listening. Killer Psychologist video episodes are now on YouTube and you can post your responses there. For episode details and merch, check out KillerPsychologistPodcast.com. And for forensic services, you can book online at PsychologyDR.com. That's PsychologyDoctor.com.